George, I'm so Money. happy. I've been, I've been like, you know, circling around you, like, like, you know, like, like those dolphins or sharks, like, you know, <laughs> and then finally I got you. Finally okay, you got I'm, you. I'm pleased to be here. I, I thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> no, no, there is everything right about you. Look, I wrote the seven questions. So I'm going to put you through the seven C's interview. We're going to go from the first one, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, the ocean gets you in a contemplative state of mind. And that contemplative state of mind often leads you to think of the past, resurfacing memory. Now, there was an author who made of resurfacing memories the foundation of his writing. And he goes by the name of Marcel Proust. He used to write from a semi recumbent position suspended like midway between the realm of sleeping and waking, using his knee as a desk. But mostly he used to write inside his room that was completely lined with cork. Now, there are many writers out there that in order to get the memories out, in order to create the experience, a recreate the experience, I should say, they have their own technique. Right. You have a very prolific blog, and I know that you made a commitment to write every single day, and you have been right. writing like, you know... Uh, 16 years. 16 years, and I, I, I recently also, like, you know, watched your uh, TED uh speech like in lisbon right uh right. was beautiful uh, so my question for you is like is there a technique or a routine that you created for yourself in order to nurture your writing with memories and recreate experiences you know there i don't i don't want to get all fancy but there's something called um the availability heuristic. So if you were shut, if you, if you wanted a new surfboard, you, you could go through life in San Diego and never see a surf shop. But the minute you want a new surfboard, you see every third store is selling sure. surfboards. Everybody's got a surfboard on their, uh, on, on the, on the top of their car. You just start seeing surfboards. You become hyper aware of it. And I feel when you give yourself the discipline of writing every day, you say, this is what I'm going to do. You have to tune in because it's pressure, right? I don't want to, I mean, nobody's going to hit me. I'm not going to lose any money, but it's, it's my kind of sense of self. And so I feel like I have to, as I walk through the world, as I go through the world, as I talk to you, as I talk to friends, as I read things in the paper, you have to constantly be looking for an article, for an idea, for a thought, for a connection of two strange things. You know, sometimes it's something I read in the, a lot of times it's something I read in the New York Times. It's an obituary. It's a little piece of information here. Yesterday in the Times, for instance, or the day before, I'm not sure which, I, I haven't done anything with it yet, but there was an article, an op-ed about the thing that makes a hot restaurant is how they treat their employees. Right. It's, and I said to myself, well, gee whiz, I mean, I know we have work to do at agencies, and so does a restaurant. They have meals to make, and it's not only about how we treat employees. But tr how we treat people right. has got to be a part of what makes a restaurant or an ad agency great. And so that's not something I've written yet, but I've cut out the article. I have it saved. And it's like, I'm, because I'm always looking, it's the same thing, you know, if you were at a stage in a creative thing where you were trying to come up with an idea you start looking at commercials call, on TV, I film. That, yeah, I call that percolating. Yeah, ex ex exactly. I mean, so you start becoming, you know, hyper, hyper aware of 
things your children say on the way home from school, a car you see on the yeah. road, a snippet of dialogue. You just start, I, I mean, I wrote to someone today because I get asked a lot. I say, I, I have to become an observation machine. Yeah. And you store these thoughts because not to sound like what we do is art because we do commerce, but we still deal in human truth. And the more truthful we can make something, the more real, the better it's going to be. So observation I mean, I, is at the foundation of everything. I mean, I think that you're, you're right, like, because I think if you miss the moment of observing, if you don't nurture yourself with like human observation, you're pretty much done. You're running, you, you're going to start running lean. And I think that's uh, like a car, right? I think that's uh, right. Right. Yeah, it's the danger. It's the danger that happened when you, for instance, you go from meeting to laptop, from laptop to meeting, right? And there is nothing in between. You, you don't. You don't see the world. You don't. You know, even from, you know, even from a film point of view. Uh, for instance, I was in Berlin. I was shooting something about work for IBM. And, you know, we were talking about how people work through work and they work obsessively and this and that. And somebody's taking something out, you know, the VO is something about, you know, working through lunch or whatever it is. And the guy's taking something out of a, a microwave and he just takes it out. The guy takes it out. And he says, no, it's got to be too hot. It's, it, you know, because that's that's kind of the little bit of comedy in it. That's right. that's the little bit of humanity in it. There's a there's a writer that. Uh, he's he's gone now, but he he was one of the great writers on the New Yorker, and he had a line that said he described someone as going through life like an old time waiter. <laughs> yeah, and I'm half a generation older than you, so he was two generations older than me. So this is a hundred years of observation, what we're talking about. But if you think about an old time waiter, not not in a a fast food place, but like an old busy restaurant maybe not highest end but busy you know they're always looking around like this they're scanning the room they're looking for who needs a glass of water who who, who needs bread who's waiting for something who, who wants to, to to get the check they're always looking around you know to serve better and that's that's how i am i mean that's it, your routine I, I, th that's my routine is it's like a forensic thing. It's like the world is a crime scene. I want to see what's there and how to piece it together because I have to write a story. And they're not all, sometimes they're presented to you, as you know, on a, on a silver platter. It's just like, boom, that's it. Or it's a joke and you want to tell the joke. But other times, you know, there, there, there are little things about, there are little things about nothing that you turn into an observation about work or how people deal with each other or how some people deal with pressure or whatever. That's kind of what this is. My blog isn't really about advertising per se, but it's about surviving and living in the world and dealing with the things we deal with. I mean, sometimes I'll talk about shooting a commercial or something, but you know, it's more about the pain of not having an idea, the politics, you know, when there's four teams competing for a spot, who gets to go first, you know, there's always one person in that situation where if you have 45 minutes for everyone to present, who takes 38? And how do you, you know, how do you get your thing in there? And you, and you try to, you try to make that kind of a more universal thing, not a peculiar thing, because they are universal. They're, they're yeah. archetypes. Absolutely. So that's what I do. That's, that's my awesome. that's my Proust, <laughs> not Madeline's. Your, that's your Proust. <laughs> but you know the Madeline thing is an interesting. You know, I know you didn't mention Madeline's, but well, you know, you, I've I've lived in New York my whole life. Yeah, yeah it's, I, <laughs> it's funny, man, because uh, the Madeline is uh, I haven't mentioned, but I've uh, I, I I I mentioned many times. Uh, during transatlantic, the fact that my mom uh, used to be a literature teacher and she was okay. a little off as a person. That's and, good. Uh, and then what she did to me, <laughs> it's like she started reading me 
things like uh, that weren't like appropriate for a kid of like uh, I was seven at the time. So right. she started reading me Proust, uh, only the inch bit. So from the first book, he wrote seven books. So the first one, which is, uh, I know the French title, like uh, Du Côté de Chez One. And uh, she started reading me the inch bit, uh, like, you know, and I was seven. And then she started describing me about like, you know, these uh, bedroom, like with Lionel Cork and the, f- the fact that Marcel was always like sick uh, at the time when he was a kid growing up. And then there was a passage that she used to recite to me, and it was about the Madeleine. And the, the Madeleine that, like, you know, he tasted and, like, and, and the and memory comes to him. Right. Like, you know, and, and it's beautiful because um, it's really, like, it's it's my childhood somehow. It's, well, <laughs> it's the funny thing about, I've lived in New York pretty much my whole life. And I say every time I go outside, I go to four or five different cities because I remember this street in 1965 with my father. Uh-huh. I remember this street in 1975 when I was in college. I remember the street in 1985 when I was starting in the business and poor 1995 with children. And now as an old man, you know, and you see, well, I remember when that used to be a this. And I remember when cabs looked like that and it becomes this kind of blending of you know, it's it's a little bit, I wrote this on my blog, you know, Hera- I'm not sure how to pronounce it in Greek, Heratic- Heraclitus. 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 Yeah, who, who, who's the one who said you can't step in the same river twice. Right, yeah. But you can't step in the same city twice. I mean, when it you makes, go back to Italy, it's a yeah, different, it's a different Italy. It's and so you have to learn again. So interesting you talk about New York because it made me think about uh, the Ulysses uh, from Jane Joyce. Uh, right, you know, just like which is pretty much written in one day around right. Dublin, right? Kind right. Of like made me feel like you one day around New York. Yeah, I mean like, that's like literally so, the journey of that, a, a Ulysses. Yeah, so we have to, we have to. I mean, I think that's what we're supposed to be. Do- you know, it's funny, and I don't know if you have this experience. Sometimes, you know, there'll be. It's almost like relationships that didn't work out for this reason that maybe you were shy maybe you were late asking someone out maybe this happened maybe that happened maybe there's another man involved or another woman involved but you as you're older you replay some of those things and sometimes i replay assignments that i got that i i know i i might have i might have gotten the ad out or the commercial but i didn't nail it and now it's like 30 years later damn i should have used that song and it's like because you never really stop working you never stop. you never stop working on an assignment even when it's over right. you know you're just like oh that scene i should that little observation that yeah so it that's how i feel like i feel like we're constantly making that i mean i'm not trying to be pretentious but we're trying to assemble and it's almost like a moviola taking little scraps four frames, six frames, 10 frames. And then we're always mixing it up, but we're trying to tell something cohesive somehow. Yeah, it's so true. So true. That's a great observation, George. I'm on the second question, man. Okay, I I, I don't give short answers. No, no, no yes or no here. Like, let it go, man. Just let it go. Like, you know, just let's let's enjoy the, the, the journey. Okay. Baia was an ancient Roman town situated on the northwest, northwest of the Gulf of Naples. As of today, it is completely submerged. Reports suggest that most part of the city lies at a depth of less than 20 feet, and around 2,000 years old remains are found underwater in almost perfect condition. Now, a sunk city is a gigantic loss of knowledge. What do you think is the equivalent of Baia in advertising? Was that loss of knowledge that we experience, if there is, and that is completely submerged? It's still there and we can look at it, but it's forever gone from like, you know, the present. I, I have two, 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 two part answer. Right. Just, just the little conversation we had before you started recording. 
So I don't know you well. You don't know me well. I didn't leave college and go to advertising school and put together a portfolio. I don't think you did either. You were here, you were there, you had a crazy mother, a, a father who was teaching you about boxing and Rocky Marciano and life. And you were living probably a little hand to mouth like I was. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And you did stuff like Herman Melville, since we're talking about authors said, a whale ship was my Harvard and my Yale college, right? He learned, I mean, can you imagine being on a whale ship in 1830? What wow. that must've been like? He learned about life. And now, I mean, I know I sound like an old man, but now you go to, go to an agency and everybody just goes from college to ad school. Like, I don't know anyone who taught in an inner city school, who dug ditches, who played baseball in Mexico, who, you know, I don't know, rode a motorcycle across the Gobi Desert. I don't know. But I don't know anyone who has like, spiritual dirt under their fingernails and who's who who had to like live a little bit so i think we so i i think that is a, a loss by the way there's a book out there's a book it's a couple years old i read it i think it's called shadowlands and it's about nine cities that were lost baya isn't one of them but there's a there's a uh an iron age city in london in england that fell into the sea mm. and they can see remnants i mean this is from five thousand years ago of course like you know so it's it's pretty interesting the other bit of it is i think related so the film director gene renoir who probably has more films in the top hundred than any other director even your countrymen de sica and fellini and rossellini you know the grand illusion Bond, Bodu saved from drowning, you know, uh, uh, rules of the game, a couple other I'm forgetting right now. He said, loitering, loitering is the heart of all civilization. Mm -hmm. So, because when you loiter, you do what we're doing now. You right. take a walk down the street, you, t you ask about memories, you talk about, we don't even know each other. You're telling me about your mother and Proust and Madeline's. You know, we're getting into, we're dredging out memory and we're talking about things. In agencies now, we're not supposed to do this. Not only do we not have a sofa to sit on, will people look askance at you if you're, I'm not a drinker, but are you drinking a beer or a cup of coffee? You don't really have two hours, three hours, four hours to shoot the shit because it's, oh, you've got a job number, you've got to show 100% billability or 120% billability, or you'll get fired when they tell you, you know, when we have to make our numbers and we're not making our numbers, the timetables are so compressed. You don't have a week or week and a half to do this. So I think those, those are the things that inhibit us from going deep, from learning about, and I, I don't even care if it's just the history of the business. I mean, one of the reasons Rob and I are so fond of each other and uh, I'm friendly with Dave Trott from from um you know English ad legend is and this is both good and bad but we all have the same heroes in the business we all love the same work at some point you know from a little obsessive compulsive we all memorize the Volkswagen ads you know we, we yes. all had them we all you know whether you're a writer or an art director you study those things. Right. And now, because you can come from a technology thing, you can, you can say a lot of people in advertising talk about how they hate advertising or TikTok doesn't work that way or this doesn't have. It's all, it's all a mess. We don't have any, we don't I have. Think, I think what you say that was very interesting to me is the depth, the lack of depth uh, where you don't have time to truly like, you know, even like shoot the shit, as you say, or go deep. There is this yeah. constant, like, you know, uh, movement, motion that's always like on the surface. Like, you know, reminds me a lot of like, you know, those like seagulls that just like go like, you know, 
on the surface. They they never yeah. really dive in. They never dive right. in. All is like goes like on the surface. They're just scoping, yeah. Scoping, that's it. And that's what we do. And I think that's uh, is something that is missing, has been missing. And you see it in the work as well. Because the work uh, has a time relevancy that uh, it's interesting, but as a lack of depth that is almost like uh, make you uncomfortable and and that's not just in advertising but the lack well, of it's a it, it's a lack everything? of depth in knowledge about people too absolutely you know that's why it seems i don't watch a lot of television but it seems like almost every commercial ends with people dancing i yes. mean i'm not a dancer but i don't when something good happens to me i don't start dancing i might say to my wife oh i got a check but you know i, I don't start like rocking out because I saved 20 cents on a Subway sandwich. I mean, that's not, so I feel like, you know, from a, a human, from a human empathy point of view, you know, I, I talk about this a lot on my blog. There's a, there's a great ad from the late sixties, early seventies done by the Carl Alley agency. Mike Tesh was the uh, art director and it's, he, he kind of replicated the cover of, of the, Arthur Miller played Death of a Salesman. A schlumpy guy wearing a, a, a raincoat shot from behind, carrying two salesman suitcases. Yeah. And the headline is for Hertz. The headlines is something like the death of a traveling salesman. And you, as a reader, if you travel for business and if you know, you're traveling for business, you know those pains. Yes. You know the pain of get, especially in a pre ATM day. You realize you land in a in a strange city. There's no GPS. You got to rely on somebody else for, you know, for uh, directions. There's no ATM. All you have is a ten dollar bill. How are you going to get through the, your zipper breaks? What do you do? You know, like now it's just like everybody behind the counter in a commercial is smiling, and we all break into dancing or we're singing along to the radio. There's no reality to it because I don't think anybody. Going back to the earlier question of living life, not just making ads, ads are supposed to be a reflection of life, not a reflection of a fantasy life. Mm -hmm. So without really knowing, I mean, you and I both know, they call them diseases of despair in this country. Diseases of despair are epidemic proportions. People who drink too much, people who are too heavy, people who use drugs, people who abuse or sell themselves or their wives, or the epidemic of of of, of uh, gun violence or domestic violence. You, if you watch TV, you think that everybody's rich and everybody's happy, and they're all just waiting for the pizza rolls to come out of the oven. Mm -hmm. But it's not. There's no. That's not reality. It's not. And in fact, I think like. From time to time, there are ads that come along that they just like goes maybe like two, uh, 200 feet down deeper and everybody is in awe because they, they stand out so, so much from like the rest of the clutter. That's what I noticed. Like, you know, we develop like as a human being, we develop like a habit towards mediocrity and we right. get used to it right but when something comes along that is not excellent it's just like above mediocrity it looks excellent to our eyes because like you know mediocrity is the and the lack of death is what we deal on on an everyday basis i think so the, I, the thing that to me in the past couple of years really did a great job was the long form stuff that Apple did in house, the underdog series, yeah, I of love the it. the the crew of people who really didn't like the boss. They were working in an impressive environment, and you got that sense that there was real pain here, that. and there was a real feeling of. But this is the, uh, no, please, please tell me. No, I I mean from you know the word I use a lot, I mean. I use two words when I talk about advertising. One is empathy. 
because I have to feel what you're going through if I'm going to sell you something. And the other is truth, and they're related. But without empathy, without the fear, you, you know, the fear of how am I going to feed my children? How am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, how, how am I going to deal with a boss who's, who's, a, who's a shouter? Or I don't have any ideas, what the fuck? You know, or... See, you know, empathy, empathy is related to depth. Because right. uh, of if, course. You, if you look at the etymology of the words, empathy comes from Greek, which comes right. from like sum pathos, which means right. like with passion. Right. Uh, that's what it is, with sentiment, pathos, right? And sum right. is will. So pathos is only like, you know, manifest, only like, you know, with depth. Like if you stay on the surface, there is no pathos. Every, everything right. become very plastic, very yeah, like yeah. You know, it's it's empty. it's all a cliche. It's all a I cliche. Mean, exactly. It's all like you look at it a, a commercial for virtually any category, and and the big categories to me, I don't watch a lot of TV or healthcare. There's no reality in healthcare. Telco, like people gushing about their phones, and it's like oh my god. It, it it can't yeah. and nobody who's drinking beer in a commercial or not drinking beer because you're not allowed to drink beer nobody is like sad they're all about to pick up the 12th most beautiful woman in southern california sadness <laughs> you sadness, know, you know? sadness is not a color that uh no rising deal with it's but, uh it's no uh, but they, there's not even any like i need you know what? I'm married th almost 39 years. I need a break from my wife. That's why I'm going to the bar. There's not even that kind of. Uh, it's not. Yeah, there are like uh, there are sentiments that they're not portray in the in the today advertising because they are not considered like you know, um, they're not considered appropriate for lack of a better word. So, no. for instance, like Jonathan Glazer, surfer uh commercial uh it's that film is made entirely of silence waiting um silence waiting and then a very like you know um unique voiceover right like those kind of elements won't be uh yeah. accepted in in now in, in two days like you know uh industry it just, no, in a, it, no, we have to always fine. end with a smile. Absolutely, that's completely gone. Like you know, I think there are what as a creator, what I truly recognize is like, and I and I become very convinced. Timing is so extremely powerful as concept, right? Because it truly destroys and creates an effect the output, the outcome of what we create, right? Things that we created like 30 years ago, they couldn't be created now because mm -hmm. society has changed around, right? You know, there's so many like example I could bring, like, you know, there won't be another Quentin Tarantino shopping around the screenplay of Reservoir Dogs and getting it done with like RV Catella attached to it. Right. The industry is not shaped that way anymore. So that time is gone forever. That's a chunk of time with a chunk of creative gone forever. Like a meteorite that just like gone by. You can't catch it anymore. Like, you know, I no. think it's like, and that's how it is. And these other things now, it's so different. It's like once I I, I was watching like Bob Dylan um, interview and it's a famous interview. There is a YouTube video. And he say, and someone asked him about like it's a Raima, the song that he wrote, mm -hmm. it's probably one of the best ever written lyric, like you know, by any anybody, like you know, it's 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 a true poem. And he says, like, I wouldn't be able, he says, like, can you write a song like that? So he say, No, I say, No, I did it one time, I won't do it anymore. He say, Why? And he say, like, well, because I'm not able to do it, I can't do it. Right. And he said, what do you mean you can't do it? He says, like, I did it once and that's it. I can do something else now, but I can't do that. Those are verses that are written magically 
yeah. they are written like you know with the time around like you know the old like culture the old system around that created that right you know it's like if you if you were to go right now in front of city light books reciting how old you want <laughs> the Helen Gisberg, you'd be a fucking fool. It's like it doesn't work that way anymore. You're not in the no. Sentence, you know no. I mean? and, and if you look at it, because <laughs> I have not too long ago, because I've written it for advertising, you can't <laughs> say half the words. Yeah, you can't say half the words that they would be yeah. completely gone. Anyway. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Okay, Captain Blood. Yes, Raphael Sabatini. Yes, it's a 1985 film that tells the tale of an imprisoned doctor and his fellow prisoners who escape their queer island captivity and become pirates. Now, there is a quote in that movie that stuck with me. I'm sure you know that quote very, very, oh, very yeah. well. Yes. And it goes like this. He was born with a gift of laughter and a sense that the world was mad. If you were to write a quote for yourself that encapsulates your essence, what would that quote be? You know, it's funny you bring up that quote, and it's actually from Scaramouche, yeah. another Raphael Sabatini. But my dog of just died. Whiskey. And I, whiskey. And I, I just wrote a little tribute about her on my blog. And, I, and that was the quote I used to describe her. Because, you know, a dog has a sense that the world is mad because it's like, what do you mean you're not sniffing people's asses and running around and eating and eating steak, you know, that you found in the garbage? What are you, what are you crazy? But she always, you know, she always made us laugh. Um, you know, for me, it, it you know, and, and this has probably been through all the questions. It's, it's as much as I'm talking a lot, I, I really believe we have to do the work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, we, I, I, I hated when I was in an agency and people would talk about how they're going to shoot it and you know how the lighting was going to be and this is going to be the DP and this and that and the other thing. Well, well, where's the freaking script? Right. Where, what are happen? we? Show me the work. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I want to see the work. And do you know Christy Cordes, the headhunter? No, she's a very good headhunter, um, and she she kicked me in the ass. Oh never yes, yes, I do know. Sorry, yeah. I was like dealing with the pronunciation. Of course, yes, yeah. I know her. So, yeah, a, about twenty five years ago, I never met her. I mean, we talk on the phone. She called me up out of the blue, literally out of the blue, and she goes, "George, you're doing it all wrong. It's not about." carrying around a big you know leather portfolio you got to get your work on a site and here's what you have to do and this and that and the other thing it's like who is this woman and because her advice was something i didn't want to hear i tried to ignore it well i've stayed in touch with her and about literally right when COVID started i'm, I'm in connecticut i've never been in connecticut before and she calls me up on my cell phone and she goes, I'm mad at you. Like, I don't even know. I didn't know you. <laughs> you know, we've never had a drink. We've never, she says, I just went on Twitter. You only have 96 followers. You have to get on Twitter. <laughs> and I do what people do, especially people my age with social media. You know what, Christy, I have a lot of LinkedIn followers. I have a big blog. I don't need another social media outlet. And she goes, George, this is the way it works now. All the recruiters are 25. All the, all the people are, who are the gatekeepers and agencies, they spend their day on Twitter. They see something funny. If they see that person funny consistently, they go to their LinkedIn. If they like their LinkedIn, then they'll go to your portfolio. Go, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't know that that that's a tip it's not how the business grew, i grew up in works but you know what i understand that and but what i realized and i'm i'm getting to your answer is that the portfolio that we do that we've always done portfolio is work you have done it's not work you're doing it's looking backwards 
It's not looking forward. Right. So I said to myself, to go to your first question, I think, about being prolific, I said, I don't want to talk about the work I can do and show you work I've done in 2018 or 2019 or I shot with Pitka, and so I really had nothing to do with it. Um, I want to show you every day what I can do. That's my job. That's, that's who you're getting if you hire me. And if you think about it, it's like, you know, I see people with fantastic portfolios and they've got, you know, a list of 609 awards, but what can you do? Show me what you do. And I'm not advocating for social media because a lot of it is crap and people, oh, I had a great cheese sandwich for lunch. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about showing a little bit of your soul, a little bit of your character, a little bit of your sense of humor. And that takes work. Like this is like, that's how I approach life. I approach life as like, it's a competition and you have to, I don't want to lose it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking 65. Who wants a 65 year old copywriter? Nobody. And, but I don't want to, I'm busier now than I've ever been because I bust my ass and that's, you know, I don't have a quote around it other than maybe, you know, like the Romans had uh labore. Ora as, labora. Yeah. 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 You know, that's like work is work is love. And work is prayer. And I really kind of believe that, that there's something defining and soul nurturing about creating and helping. We help people with our work. We're not artists alone. We help clients. And that's my job. And I'm serious about it. I like to goof around. I like to tell jokes. Don't get me wrong. But work is what I do. Yeah, that's a great answer, man. That's a great answer. I, I love the fact that we landed on Ora Elabora. That's yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> hey, look, I'm going to give you like a Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman uh, uh, poem. It's called like Gliding Over Roll. And uh, it's also the eighth episode of Breaking Bad. But I mean, there is not a... Uh, I don't know if people know, maybe people, a lot of people know that the guy that wrote like Breaking Bad uh, was in love with Walt Whitman. Walt, I did not know that. In fact, in fact, the name of the character in Breaking Bad is, oh. it's come from Walt Whitman. The I did not know that. So Gliding Over All is also the title of the eighth episode of Breaking Bad, but it's actually a poem from Walt Whitman. So there is a lot of like, you know, connection. And what Whitman write in this poem, a gliding over all, through all, through nature, time, and space, as a ship on the waters advancing, the voyage of the soul. If you were to glide over your entire career, just tell me one thing that comes in mind. Just one thing. You know, I thought about, I reread the questions, you know, a couple hours ago. And I was going to go back and forth about work again. But I realized I spent too many years being shy. Hmm. Now, today we might call that imposter syndrome. I felt like I wasn't as good as people because I'm not cool. Um, and I don't do a lot of popular culture. And so I don't know a lot about, you know, popular music and stuff like that. So I, I always felt like, uh, and, you know, I, I set out to be a university professor. So I was never like, cool. Um, and so I was afraid to talk to people like bosses. I was afraid to show my own personal sides because if I showed if you went to, you know, K, M, L, and J right now for a job interview and you're interviewing and you started talking about Marcel Proust and Walt Whitman, you would not get the job. <laughs> um, I mean, so if you were talking about, you know, 
people I don't even know, but um, you would get the job. Okay. Um, but, you know, so I, I feel like I, I spent a lot of time suppressing who I am. Hmm. And, and so my, my, my parallel of Whitman was I wasn't sailing on the ocean. I was submerged. You know, I did not, I wasn't, I wasn't confident enough to come up to the surface and say, well, yeah, we could do that. But I I know this is a little weird, but I see this. and, And what do you think of that? And I was, you know, so I, for a long time, you know, I always produced a lot of work, but I think I produced work trying to please other people rather than trying to be true to my cosmos. So interesting. That is so interesting when you just say, I spend a lot of time suppressing myself. This gonna but, be- but I think a lot of people in advertising do. Oh, you yeah. know, I think, I think, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, that the, the, they either over assert themselves because they think everybody cares about their interest in mid-century modern. So every spot has to be about mid-century modern. Well, 12 people care about it. But, you know, I think, you know, if you think about like the Walter White, the Breaking Bad, or in some of the more sophisticated like movies and dramas, you see these kind of homages to Orson Welles or this or that. And it's like, those aren't like common, that's not the common currency of the world we live in. Mm-hmm. But the people who can bring that. No, in, fa- in fact, like it's, it's so interesting because in fact, now you say like, you know, I don't even know if people knew that's the guy that wrote like, you know, Breaking Bad was in love with Walt Whitman, right? You know, Walt White come from Walt Whitman. But I'll tell you even right. more, something that I found out just recently, uh, everybody knows the movie, The Warriors, right? Uh, you probably right. know the movie, The Warriors, so with yeah. the, the gangs in New York. Yeah. Okay, that movie was a book, okay? The idea of gangs going back to their hometown and like you know in the movie there is like the warriors they had to go back travel like from uh, the bronx to coney island the right. old idea come from the uh xenofonte anabasi uh the author of that movie he, the author of the book was in love with greek history study greek history oh interesting and he developed this idea by reading uh, the opera of Xenophonte Anabasis, where <laughs> a squad of warriors in the Xenophonte Anabasis, they traveled back home. And through that journey, they encounter different obstacles. So, so right. a lot of Because life- that's an archetypical story. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 a thousand years old story, right? I revise in modern time, anyway. Well, you know, it's funny when I when I was working on IBM, and I had people there who appreciated it more than I think. I'm I'm looking for something. That's why the screen is shaking. Who appreciated it more than I think a lot of people do um, now? We were launching Watson the you know the, yeah, the yeah, ai yeah. which is very relevant again this is eight years ago and we were doing an eight page insert and my boss was he said well, what should we do on the front page and i was there all night that night and the thing i was trying to sell i didn't sell it was from hamlet it was what a piece of work is man oh, you know ha- you know, it, it's yeah. that that how infinite in reason, in, in you know, in 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 form and motion, how how like a god, right? Because I because the whole theme was about elevating humanity. Of course, you know, it's let's not forget, and 
when I say man, I don't mean just men. Obviously, yeah, you have to say this now, but this is about us and 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 us being better humans, and that's what this machine is about. And you know, it might have gone right over the head of a lot of people reading it, but what a piece of work is man, and this machine is going to make you better. Is like wow, I still think I was right. Oh yeah, you were right. You should have gone for it, man. You oh, were, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a great, it's a great thinking, great thinking. Okay, look, I'm gonna give you Pink Floyd and Roger Waters. Okay, we just we are just two lost souls swimming. Yes, we in are. The <laughs> These verses were penned by Roger Waters and immortalizing the song "Wish You Were Here." The song was dedicated to Sid Barrett, the founder, the mastermind of Pink Floyd, who left the group in a, in a very Sid Barrett fashion after having destroyed his brain with LSD. Oh. He made his he, he walked all the way back from, from London to Cambridge, where he was born, his hometown. And disappear. He only reappear once. I don't know if you know this story. No, Luke. I don't. This is actually a scary story. Uh, the Pink Floyd, where Steve Barry left, was already like gone mentally, and disappeared for twenty years. He went back to his mom house. Uh, one day, the Pink Floyd were recording. The song "Wish We Wish You Were Here" and the song is dedicated to Sid Barrett. And Roger Waters recounted that, that day at the Abbey Road Studio where they were recording, there was this man, kind of chubby, bold, and he hung around the studio for quite some time, watching them playing. And at one point, Roger Waters say. Is that Sid? And he was Sid Barrett. Wow. He was Sid Barrett that after 20 years, he came right on the day they were recording Wish You Were Here. And then he just walked away after one hour, like never ha ever happened. Right. And that's it. If they, <laughs> that's a crazy story. But anyway. Yeah, it is. If there, is there anybody that you will, love to have around in the advertising industry you know i it doesn't have to be gone mad but like you know not everybody has yeah. gone mad but you know um i gotta say i'm you know it's one of the joys of ogilvy and i was at ogilvy for parts of four decades i wasn't there for 40 years but i was there in the 90s the zeros the tens and the 20s and you know, it's a little bit, and this is snobby, but it's a little bit like the shy at people. You know, it's you're in a club, and, yeah. and you're you're kind of a made man. Like if you went to Harvard, or s s something like that. It's yeah. it's you know these. If you were accepted in this group, I know you know I know this this friends for life, in a way, and you know I've been lucky that I was accepted in that group, not not as much as maybe I wanted to be because of some of my shyness and some of that, but I'm still friendly with Steve Hayden and I get to work with him now and again, the guy who wrote 1984, the uh, commercial. And I get to work with him now and again. And, you know, we get to do this. We get to talk about movies and books and the industry and then we'll get along to for working on the assignment together and that is a challenge in that you're dealing with someone who's brilliant and but such a such a freaking blessing it is such a you know it is such a privilege to have that. I'll tell you a story. 
and 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 this isn't quite the Sid Barrett story, but it has little pieces of it because I believe I don't believe in any celestial beings or anything, but I do believe if you leave the door open, interesting people come into your life. And so back in probably 2003, I had seen a job and the, they still ran help wanted ads in the paper in New York at the time. And I said, you know, I got to get out of advertising. I'm, I'm old enough. And there was a job, I went to Columbia and there was a job at Columbia University as like director of communications. And, uh, you know, I'm, oh, 20 years ago, I'm 65 now, so I'm already 45. But I figure, well, you know, a lot of times university jobs, they pay for your kids to go to college. So I said to myself, I'm probably too young to apply for this. Chances of getting it are one in a thousand anyway. But what the hell? What does it cost me? I write a letter. Next thing I know, you know, they're calling me up for an interview. and you know, I, I go up there and I, I meet a bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, the salary was ridiculously low. Um, but, you know, I liked the people. I met the people. I, you know, even though it was only like 2003, we'd linked in and whatever. And then literally, Simone, 10 years later, I get a call from one, one of these people. You know, my husband's an architect. And he's looking to rent the space. Anyway, I have to do a poster for the school, a, you know, a poster to, uh, you know, recruit students or whatever the hell it is. And my husband's an architect and he's looking for space. And he was shown by the realtor this floor in somebody's brownstone. And it turns out this guy is, I don't know, maybe you've heard of him because you're in the business. Milton Glazer, have you heard of him? And I'm like, what? So she says, so I talked to Milton Glazer, and I said, we'd like to do this poster. Would you art direct it? And he goes, yeah. And so she says to me, would you be the writer? So I, I go, yeah. Well, are you kidding me? Well, I mean, he's a he's a hero. I mean, I know we're not supposed to have heroes, but he's he's a bona fide hero. So I meet with him at 7.30 in the morning. He's got a brownstone. He had a brownstone off of 3rd Avenue between 2nd and 3rd. It's like the last building still there. Right. Over the transom, talk about Aura and Labora, he's got art is work over the transom. Right. Beautiful. And so I jumped into a cab to go down there. And I'm going down 2nd Avenue. And there's a synagogue on the corner. I live on the Upper East Side. There's a synagogue on the corner of 79th and left, and 79th and Second. So we, we make that turn, going down Second Avenue. And you know how sometimes uh, uh, religious institutions have like a placard up, and they'll have yeah. like a saying from the Bible yeah. or something. And you know, so I don't have any ideas yet. We haven't even started working. But there's a quote on this thing from Leviticus. I'm not religious at all. But I read it because sometimes these things are profound. And they're our foundational texts. And it says, to teach is to learn, and to learn is to teach. And well, that's my fucking headline. So I, I literally get in the cab. I see this. Ten minutes later, you know, I'm knocking on Milton's door. I'm sitting at his giant table, you know, and he's scribbling. And I say, you know. We just start talking, shooting the shit. And I say, well, this is a little weird, but I saw this quote. And he goes, hmm. And he's doodling. And he draws a little, he draws a big flower in a pot, talking to a little flower in a pot. And I said, yeah, it's, you know, to teach is to learn and to learn is to teach. He goes, yeah. And he draws this little cartoon. He, had, he used a pencil that had four different color leads in it. So his uh, his drawings came out with mm -hmm. almost like a dimension, almost like looking at the world in 3D glasses, but it's not 3D. And he goes, okay. You know, after about an hour, he goes, okay. Let's let that marinate a little bit. 
And, you know, I call back in a couple of days. Uh, how's the marination going? Like you said, percolation. So let's let it marinate. He goes, yeah, I think we're going to do that. He sends me the art. And I mean, it didn't turn out great, to be honest with you. But I, I don't know, to me, like you open up your doors and those people are out there. And going back to question three, where I said I spent too much time being shy or s sublimating myself or suppressing myself, you stop doing that. And all of a sudden, Milton Glaser opens the door. The you know, thing. it's like it, it's putting yourself out there. Even if you're not inherently a confident person, because I don't know anyone who is really a lot of people fake it. But you put yourself out there and things happen. Yeah, the universe, and, the universe has ears. That yeah, happens. yeah, and and things, and and it's weird, but things happen. And you know, I tell this story all the time because it happened to me. You know, I got fired at sixty-two. That's not young in this business. Yeah. And I was making decent money. And at the time, I was having some domestic troubles with my children. They weren't talking to me. And we, we leave New York the first time in my life. I'm out of New York, really, you know, for an extended period. And I'm like, everything I loved, I lost. Ogilvy, my career, my children aren't talking to me, my city. I had to reinvent myself. I, now, I could have gone sit in my chair and gone like this and, and, and hunched over and just do what you do when you're depressed because I had all the I had all the kind of inputs of depression <laughs> you know I, a lot of the world was could have made me depressed and I said no I'm going to stick to what I do which is work and try to be funny and try to be real and, and like out of the blue people are ca start calling me because you you put you, somehow you're letting off you know like I said it, it's I don't really believe in tarot and, you know, cards and things like that. But I do believe, you know, if you put yourself out there, there's weird, like, weird vectors hit. And you meet people and shit happens when you least expect it. And, and, and you can look at it and you go, well, of course that happened. Look how hard you were working at X, Y, and Z or you're always looking at signs of course you saw a sign that time and it just happened to hit but this is all actually very thematic because i'm always talking about make yourself an observation machine and don't be afraid to go for the connections you know that's and and that to me i don't know if i'm answering your question but you know, that that's my little moment of like, wow, I get to work with these people. I get to work with Steve Hayden. I get to talk to Shelly Lazarus on the phone. You know, I get to work with these people. I've done something right. Like I don't even know what it is. But, you know, a, a little bit of it is that Woody Allen thing. I show up, <laughs> you know, and, and I work. You know? Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, it's like discipline is something that uh, discipline is something that I didn't appreciate like uh, very much. Like at the beginning of my like, uh, I wouldn't say career, but you know, for me it was always very easy because uh, I've been writing since I was like you know probably like well six years old. Like you know, I never stopped. But I think I went through like the very bohemian. Uh, uh, way of like you know approaching the my creative work like you know in my twenties I was like you know always writing at nights and like you know never never constant like you know typing on the typewriter smoking like a chimney like you know I wanted to get to that kind of state like very bohemian but not discipline at all uh, and I think that impacted my writing as well. Like, you know, so I went through the, all that phase, but uh, only like, you know, in the past 10 years, probably I deliberately found like, you know, a routine and like, you know, I give myself some discipline and like, and I show up and I right. try to show up every single day. Like I try to not let any day go by without like at least writing something like it doesn't have to be a perfectly like, you know, crafted poem, but 
it, it has to be something. It has to be something right. that just to keep it going, like you know. And I think that's um, yeah. I think it, my my mentality changed radically because I used to think that if you force it, if you like, you know, you you have to wait for the inspiration to come. But I think that's uh, inspiration is like it's a full gaze. <laughs> it's just like yeah. like you know, it's it, it's showing up. To do the work and to write and to create this routine for yourself is like paramount and like you know it's funny because I, I had it there before my eyes because all the writers i loved uh had this routine except for one which was a waste of talent uh, francisco fitzgerald i think like you know uh, spent too much time parting uh right. more talent was, than discipline you know, it's like, but he, he was an amazing talent. Like, right. you know, but then like, when you look at like everybody, you look like a Faulkner and Cheever and Hemingway, they always have like a very, very strict discipline, you know, in writing. So, um, yeah, I changed my my mindset a lot. So show up, it's a great, it's a great, like show up in front of the blank page is a great, like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think things happen when you do. And yeah. when you, you, you know, a lot of, I, I've taught school a couple of times, you know, advertising and the question you get more than any other is, you know, well, I'm stuck. I have writer's block or I don't, and I said, ah, just write, just, just, yeah. just let it go. you know, and I wrote about this on the blog the other day. I had this teacher when I was a kid and, you know, a writing teacher, you know, just in high school. And, you know, of course, you're, I don't know what to write about, you know. And he'd say, okay, here's what you do. You take a piece of paper, you fold it in half, and you write at the top of the left yeah. column, I hate, and you write at the top of the right column, yeah. I love. And then you just, just start writing. Absolutely. And you're going to find something. You have to let your hands go. They, they say the same things in boxing, right? Yeah. But like a boxer, like, stand in front of the opponent and he doesn't let his hands go. It's like you're always, like, very stiff. You have to be fluent to let your hands go. And that's right. kind of like, you know things that you should apply in writing or any kind of a creative work. You had to let yourself go. There was another creative I interviewed I had on Transatlantic and it was, uh, uh, I don't know if you know him, but uh, it was a big name uh, in the, in the uh, like in, in 2000, in the 90s, Marcelo Serpa um, is like, mm. he was running like, you know, Alma BBTO, like uh, it's great art director. And he told me the same thing, he told me like, you know, like, what I do every day, I just like I just show up and do the work, and I and I don't and I don't like obsess over like this is not perfect, this is not right. Like you know, I just do it. I just do it. Like you know, and like yeah. I think that's the best, the best advice. You know. Yeah, that's 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 where my head is, and I mean, yeah. I read something about a novelist. I don't touch type, but I read something about someone, a writer who who would blindfold himself and type because he didn't want to read what he was writing. Mm. He didn't want to like criticize and go back right. and, and try to make it better. And, and, and yeah, well, you know, you know the... that's, that's interesting because there was, that's something I struggle with. I think that, you know, I mean, I remember like William Burroughs got rid of punctuation all, all together. Yeah. Like, you know, for that. And, and Kerouac taped the pages together. A scroll. Or, so yeah. There, there are yeah. a lot of like writers that do that. And yeah. There is like, but there's also writers that have like a, a a very defined amount of like page that they write every single day. You know, like they say, okay, I wake up this morning and I write every day. I write like three page, like, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, yeah, I think well, like whatever works for you, but at the end but of the, the day, like, yeah. But you know how in physics, and I'm not getting religious, but they'll talk about the God particle. Yes. There's a God particle, whether or not it's God, you know, capital G. So uh, the American writer, William Styron, you know, who I think is terrific. He's, he's gone now. But, you know, Sophie's Choice, Confessions and Nat Turner, The Long March, really great writer. Um, his daughter wrote a book called Reading My Father. And uh, she's a writer. She's a good writer. And she told the story about her, her father was depressive and he wrote a great book about living with depression called, um, oh, fuck, it totally escapes my mind. It's only 84 pages. It'll come to me. She tells a story that they lived in uh, Cape Cod 
in the summer at least. And he had a house that he lived in and then a house that he rode in. And he had, you know, this is pre-computer. He had all the pages printed out and laying on a bed, you know, in, in order, you know, in sheaves, or maybe 10 pages each. And he had the windows open and the wind blew through and knocked all the pages out randomly. And, you know, we don't put page numbers down when we're working. Right. It slows you down. And he said, you know what? I'm just putting them together. And, and, it, and it came out okay. That's you like know, the, it, the cat, the cat, like the cat, uh, Pastin cat, like the cat run, like how do you call like the uh, cats and copy like technique? Cat oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the monkeys and the typewriters type in Hamlet. The yeah. Technique of the big generation, right? Of William, yeah. Bowen, like, you know, they used to like cut and run. How is it called? The cut and run technique or cut and copy technique? Oh, something? I don't know. I don't know. I don't they will like, uh, they will get a tax. Alan Gisberg and a lot of the big generation guys, like Gregory Corso, uh, mostly William Borough, they used to get a tax and write a paragraph and then they would take scissors and cut it. And then they will reassemble the words uh, all together just randomly. And then you would have like a completely new paragraph, but assemble like by randomness. And it's right. called like the cut and copy technique. It was very like- Oh, it's interesting. Very common but in the 70s, yeah. It's also letting your subconscious out a little bit. Absolutely, and, yeah. And 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 that's, that's, we all know, we know now, I mean, from a neurological sense, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I got the question. The question that we ask all our guests is like, if okay. there was a wind that blow your sail, you have to give it a name. What would the name be? Um, you know, I have a lot of people I'm very thankful for um, that gave me a lot of inspiration, but I'm not going to pick one. I'm just going to say that wind is it's it's like trusting the wind, the wind of work, that it's going to, it, like, Odysseus wound up home. It took 20 years, but he wound up home. Mm. And, you know, if you trust the wind and you try to be decent along the way, he wasn't so decent, but if you try to be decent along the way, like, trust the wind a little bit, mm. like, awesome. you know, the thing that was told to me about 25 years ago is we have three things as creative people we have our work we have our reputation and we have our network and all of those depend on working you know none of them come just you can't buy them at at sears hmm. you know you got to work i mean they take a long time to develop they take a long time to develop and that's where i am with it it, it's 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 really like the blessing of uh, you know i say to my daughters all the time you know and they'll be frustrated they, they both have advanced degrees and i'll say listen the reason you get an advanced degree is so you can do what you love and you know i'm lucky enough i i truly love my job i truly i don't love it every day nobody does just like you don't love your wife every day <laughs> but, but but you know enough like good you know it's paid for my apartment my house my children's education not good i'm healthy you know like i love what i do i get a lot of kudos from people it feeds my ego pays my bills i love what i do i believe in what i do and that's that's a blessing that's, that's a, a blessing. blessing it's funny because i was telling my wife the same the same things along the same lines is, uh, you know, I think like you, you join these, like you say life is a competition. So you join the race and you work towards a goal. And then you reach a certain point in life where you don't need anything anymore. The house is paid off. Right. You, you, you yeah. Like you, now, now you, it's almost like if you were a plane, now you're cruising. And right, you don't have right. to like you don't have to go forty thousand feet. You could, or fifty thousand right. feet. But you know that if you go, the higher you go, the more is going to be taken away from you. Right. So you had to have the brilliancy of 
cruising, just accepting the cruise, welcome the cruising, you know, like, I think like that's what's very difficult because I'm always prone to the, I'll say, what's next? What's, I need to get there. I need to get there rather than say, what, this is it. This is it. This is exactly what you wanted. And yeah, you could have more money. Yeah, you could make like, like, you know, but you don't need it. This is exactly what you wanted. This is the attitude that you were looking for. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's very- Yeah, you know, I have a clip of Saul Bass as an old man. It's only about a minute. I'll see if I can find it. And he says, you know what? I just want to make beautiful things. <laughs> yeah. Like sometimes I do it for clients and they don't understand and they don't want to pay. But I still want to make beautiful things. And, you know, I still want to do what I think is good. And, I mean, if someone wants to screw it up or someone wants to tell me it's not good, fine. I think it was – I'll listen. I'm not that arrogant. But that's what I want to do, and that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy conversations like this. I mean, advertising is a weird business. You can have a conversation like this. You can't have it in a lot of businesses. Yeah, that's true, man. Hey, George, it was fantastic to have you aboard. So, oh, well, thank you. Uh, I can't thank you enough, man. It's like uh, you're a brilliant mind. And I hope like, I can wish the best for you, man. Oh, likewise, Simone. And next time you're in New York, let me buy you a drink. Good. Good.